Well, it's fantastic to see uh, so many of you this morning, and uh, we've got a special service, and uh, Yanni's already alluded to it. We have a testimony service this morning, Salvation Stories, uh, and that's what this morning's worship has been about. That's what the focus of today uh, is going to be about, and I just love that, that second song that we sang. It basically says, I was a dead man walking. And at one stage, we were all dead men, dead women, walking. And he called our names, and we ran out of the grave into that glorious day. And uh, this is what this morning is about, just a mo morning of remembrance. And I've asked a couple of us uh, to share uh, with us this morning so that we can remember, so we can reflect um, just on how glorious his salvation uh, is. And so... Um, yeah, we've got a couple of people now. They're wondering, who am I going to call first? <laughs> Anybody want to stick up their hands? <laughs> there we go, Rosita. She's so brave. Come on, give her a hand, Rosita. Thank you. Well, you don't want to hear my whole life story because you'd sit here until 8 o'clock tonight. So I try to make it as, as clipped as possible. What we sang, well, 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 that's most of our life stories. I truly was blind. Today I can see. I was lost. I didn't even know how lost I was. But Jesus came after me. Jesus, as we all sit here, we all are instruments, ministering servants to the living God. Do not forget ever, someone is watching your life today. Well, to make a long story reasonably short, I have five minutes, that's far too little. <laughs> Six. Ooh. Um, I, I was truly, I was born in the war and I knew serious poverty, going to bed with, without anything. I, as a child, I thought I was the ugliest, I was the dumbest, I was Really, I did not think anything of myself. But I built walls, a coping mechanism, you could call it. And um, that worked quite well, not realizing the utter desperate state I was in. But those walls were quite good to me. On the outside, I looked confident, pretty, um, I had it all together, I was looked self-assured and everything else. That was only the outside. I knew how to cover up very well. At the age of, I was married for nine years, but was a very bad choice. I was, I had cancer when I was 31, and I knew, I thought, this is the end of my worthless life. There was nothing I could call back on that. I thought, that was fantastic. So I thought, will I only have six more months to live or so? Well, I'm going to break away. I'm going to draw a line in the sand. I'm going for it. I left Holland with a suitcase. That was all. Not knowing whether I would have a year or so to live. I went sailing on a cruise liner. I was given a job, and I thought, this is going to fulfill the last bit of my life. Well, believe it or not, my love affair was not 
on the first side, Derek was for a period of time my boss. <laughs> and um, he knew I needed help. My English was poor. And on board ship, when you have to deal with 20, 30 people at the same time, you need to be fluent in English. So Derek often came to my rescue. But we didn't love one another. It was just he was a helping hand to me. Was, uh, he was a nice guy, and I was a nice chick. <laughs> but <laughs> apart from that, there was not much going on. But in the second time of our journey on board ship, it became more than just a helping hand. There came a bit of a spark of love in it. So my life really started all of a sudden looking a lot better because now I had something that was quite different. But, you know, I was still this poor, broken, on the inside person who truly ne needed more than what I had. Well, to make a long story short, we ended up in South Africa. We got married, we ended up in South Africa, in Johannesburg. We both were unsaved. And um, I met there a family. We lived in a small holding and next to our small holding was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Afrikaans family with four beautiful children. And um, I tasted something there that was too good to be true. I knew I'd never ever tasted this kind of love and caring. And, and uh, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with Mama, and she was talking not much about the Lord, but she said, one day, I hope you come with us to church which I never did. Mama died. Skilak. And I was heartbroken. I thought, there is this God who is love, is taking this beautiful mom away. What is going to happen to this family? I was distraught. We go to the funeral, and Annika was about 14, a beautiful little girl, and she was looking the, the, um, the kissed, and she's picking out petals, and one by one, she's putting the petals on her mom's coffin with the sweetest little smile, as if she was greeting her mom for the last time. I could not, I was distraught, I was in tears. There, after a little while, Annika comes around me, puts her arm around me and says, Auntie Rosita, why are you crying so? I said, because God took your mommy away. And she said, Auntie Rosita, don't you know there is not a place on earth where my mommy would rather be? Mommy is with Jesus. I, I was lost for words. I was in agony about this whole lot. And as we drove to our own home, I said to their darling, they have something that I want. What they have is real. I couldn't figure out what it was. But I think in that hardened heart of mine, 
De Lord, dat was een crack. En de Lord started shining his light into this hardened heart. Well, we moved to another place. And there was another ministering servant of the Lord. She was very bold. And she was talking about Lord and about all those wonderful miracles which she taught me. I thought, God, doing miracles. I'll have to see that with my own two eyes. I'm not going to just believe that because my perception of God was not very pretty and not very good. So she challenged me to come with her to church. And I thought, Yes, I'm going to. I want to see those miracles. Well, it was at, at um, Rima. And as we approached, I, it was a big church. There were already lots of people. And they were worshipping. And I started weeping. And I thought, what on earth is wrong with me? I should not be weeping. For what am I weeping? Now, I was this doll with beautiful, long, false eyelashes and thick mascara and beautiful makeup. And all I'm concerned about that this whole lot, I will look like a clown afterwards. <laughs> and I am absolutely, I couldn't contain my tears. Now, I have to admit from the, the message I didn't get so much, but one thing I did get out of it, when Ray McCauley did his altar call and said, if Jesus would come to your door today, would you open him and would you be delighted to see him? And I was not too arrogant to think, oh no, I wouldn't want to see Jesus. I'm not ready for Jesus. He said, if you had to shut the door because you are not ready, would you want to make ready for it? And I thought, well, if there is a hell, I would possibly be a candidate for hell rather than for heaven. So I, I said to my neighbor, I think I want to make right. She said, well, go forward. Well, that is where my journey began. I gave my life to Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. And there, well, what you see today is what you didn't see then. There was a different Rosita, but it was left at the altar. And I could only go forward in the resurrection power of the Lord. Thank you, Rosita. <laughs> Wish I could have seen that picture of you with the long eyelashes back there. <laughs> You'll have to show, show us some photos. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, let's have the fun of Mavericks. Come, Jelle, for and Morning, church. I hope I, I remembered my notes. <laughs> um, for those who still don't know who, who we are, we are the Funamava family, and um, we take the first two rows of seats over here. <laughs> we need them. <laughs> um, this is my beautiful wife, Benora, and um, yeah, our story is quite unique. Uh, unique. Um, we both know each other from primary school, and we were in the both the same primary school, high school, and only after, I think on a friend's 21st, we, um, we uh, started dating. I think her eyes opened only then. Um, <laughs> I always had my eye on her, but uh, it took a while for her to open her eyes. <laughs> um, we, uh, uh, thanks, Rosita, for your testimony. It was beautiful. Um, and thanks, uh, also, I just want to say thanks for Tian's being here. It's all quite nice. I want to welcome him back 
What a nice, and um, Johnny, we sent you away, you, you're still coming back. <laughs> but we're glad to see you. Maybe the water in Armonas is a bit too cold. Um, let me get back to the story. We, we're opposite. There goes uh, the three minutes of our oh. ten minutes. <laughs> um, I grew up in a typical Afrikaans Van Ava home. And that's where you fall in. <laughs> and um, I was quite opposite. I grew up in an English home. My surname was Brown, so it was quite different. And um, yeah, our family was not saved. My family was not saved, but they had very good values. Um, I had Christian values as a child in our family, but not a personal relationship with God. Your turn. And <laughs> 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 we'll get it just now. Um, I was, when I was very young, we had YWAM that used to come into youth groups around the corner from us, and I used to go on a Friday night at seven. And from there, that seed was planted, and I've always had a personal relationship with Jesus. I always knew he was there. We, I gave my heart to the Lord um, when I was in the young teens, um, but... I drifted away, um, just like many teens do. Um, my, my understanding of Christianity was that it was dull and boring, and I first wanted to enjoy my life, and thought, like, let me enjoy my young teens and my life first, and then just before I die, I'll give my heart to the Lord, and I'll slip through the doors of the heaven. Um, that was my plan, you know. <laughs> teens have very smart plans, but actually stupid. Yeah, well, I, whenever I meet someone or people that I know now, I always presume that I've always been a very good girl. I always come across as being Miss Goody Two-Shoes, which I was until I hit my teen years. Um, coming from a small farm school where we attended, we, it was in quite a big shock to go to an all-girls school, which was a huge pond, only girls, and I was in boarding school, and the only way I knew how to deal with my emotions was to rebel my plans worked out great for the first while enjoying my teens enjoying life enjoying alcohol drugs girls whatever you um but then god came and shaked my foundations um you know you have smart plans when you think of it um but then after a while your plans doesn't start to work out, and you get frustrated. Um, me and Venora married, and it was fine for the first couple of years, and then I was, my plans didn't work out, because I had this plan of going to the farm, building this farmhouse, and all that, and God said, uh -uh, it's not your, it's not, that's your plan, it's not my plan for you. And I, I took out my frustrations out of out on my family, on my wife, um, never physically, but emotionally. I mean, they say the tongue is like a two-edged sword. And if I tell you, husbands, if you ever want to kill your wife, do it with your tongue. That's the, that's the worst kind. And, you know, till this day, I repent for that. But, you know, God had other plans for me. Okay, I'm going to just backtrack a little bit there to when I was still in high school. So when I started rebelling, I started with first just stealing one of my dad's cigarettes. And, you know, you get a bit of a kick out of it. You've got control over it. And then from there, it just escalated. Um, you have your first beer. Then you have a few more. And then you, we started slipping into the nightclubs. And with not dealing with my emotions and covering it all up this way, you want to then try and make friends and find comfort through people. So unfortunately, I had the wrong friends. So the way to do this was to, I wasn't friends with Stefan yet then. I had other friends. <laughs> I wasn't so, cool enough. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the cool kids weren't the, the good kids. So um, my, yeah, so my teen years spiraled down. I stopped doing sports. I stopped doing homework. I just barely got by in school. Um, but as I did that, my bad habits picked up, my bad friends picked up, and yeah, I would start telling lies to my parents that I'm sleeping over at friends, 
and we would slip out and go do stuff that wasn't so great. So yeah, just to try and, it was just a, you try to fit in more and more. So the more you, you feel like you emotionally falling apart, you drink more. You Then if someone brings out pills or you, uh, I don't know if I can say this in church, but if someone <laughs> offers you a puff of weed, <laughs> then yeah. It wasn't me, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> Yeah, so basically I tried a lot of things, I did a lot of things, but I was fortunate enough to always know Jesus. So if we had to drive home after going to a club or whatever, I always knew I could pray. And I always prayed that he'd keep us safe and get us home safely. And I always asked for forgiveness when getting back into bed at night. Um, yeah, so then Stephen and I got together and um, we lived together as a married couple for eight years before we did get married. So we always had this excuse that it's just a paper, it's fine, we don't need to get married. We bought a house together, we lived together like a married couple. But deep down inside, I knew, uh, I always just, you want to make everyone feel good, so it's fine, it's fine, we don't want to get married, we're fine. But especially for the ladies, though, it really breaks down your worth. You, you, you think that it's fine, but yeah, you, if you're a child of God, if you're a daughter of God, you're worth more than that. And if someone is willing, if they want you, then they'll commit to that. So looking back now, I know that if I'd given Stephen the ultimatum, I'm sure he wouldn't have run away. And if he did, he would have come back sometime or other. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Where I'm going on with my story is that... Um, we took off our plans of the table. That's after we both were in a great accident, big accident where we almost lost our lives. Um, we came back from a late night party, um, my cousin, and um, we're driving on the road and someone skipped the stop street and T-boned us and the bucky was gone. I was out of the bucky lying my one feet underneath the, um, my bucky's wheel. Benora was still in, um, and uh, the other four passengers in the other car that hit us all died. Um, and that's where I, I lied on, on the ground, and I didn't feel any pain. I was in that mode where, I think between heaven and earth something, and I just felt... Um, and it wasn't the weed. <laughs> no, <laughs> there was no weed involved. Um, and I just felt um, like this peace on me that God got me covered. Um, I think the devil was trying to take my life just there. Um, but God had other plans for me. Um, and I knew that moment that, um, yo, um, I told, I think my words were to Nora, I got amper bok felt to, and I get nog nie skinners gehad nie. Um, and it's so, it's so true. Um, you... You want to try everything in life and go and do it and everything, and then you, you'll, never, you'll never receive that peace, joy, and contentment in your life that God can give you. Um, everything that comes from this life is temporary, and it's just a temporary high, just a temporary high. And you always just chase that temporary high, that just, just live for the weekend, you know, and then back on Monday to work again, you don't like your work. Um, and I was in that moment, and we took off our plans off the table and said, God, we both kneeled at our bed. That's also just after we had a big fight. And um, I just want to quickly say, um, Tian was, I think he just started walking and talking. And he said, Mama, come to scrape up of you. Man, that's, that's when you, you see your evil in your life going over in your child's life. And that's where I made the decision that's not going on. I'm stopping it here. I'm not going to take it on into their lives. I'm stopping it right here, and we committed just there. We kneeled at the, the bed and said, God, we're taking off our plans of this table. We 
putting everything into your hands, please just lead us from here. Okay, so um, because Stephen and I have always had this love for Jesus, we did try to go to church. And we were part of a very big church. Um, so we went to church sporadically, and after being, we usually got to church late, though, so that we missed all the singing, so that we were just there for, <laughs> for the, for the I wasn't preaching. a good singer. <laughs> and it was, it was still a bit awkward for us. So, um, yeah, so we, we'd go to church sporadically, and every Sunday after church, we would say, oh, we really got it. And there was such a huge difference in our house. But then, unfortunately... You, someone would invite you to a braai or you would meet up with your friends and everything would just go downhill from there again. So, um, like Stefan says, we got down on our knees and we really just surrendered everything to God. We, I, I actually, the one night I just said to Stefan, I'm packing my stuff and I'm taking the kids to my mom because we've got to make a plan. And we, we both surrendered to God and from there, things just snowballed in the right direction. Yeah, um, that's amazing um, how when you start living in God's will, things start falling into plan. God had this plan all this life, and we were just waiting for us to, to fall into his plan. Um, we moved down to Franzuk. Um, that's a bit further than we thought we were going to move, but uh, coming from Pretoria. Um, and we started walking into the road with him, um, grew as Christians every day. I got baptized by teens over here. Um, as an adult, um, and um, and I'm enjoying the peace and security and joy and contentment in life like never before. Um, it's just amazing if you follow God's will, how all that pressure and bekommerness and worry just falls off your back because you've got a big daddy now looking at your back. Um, and you still got a little bit of, okay. We've got a minute. Okay. So, yeah, I just wanted to also just add on to that. When we, we gave our love, well, when we recommitted to God and we just gave everything over, we also, um, we had plans to move. We had all these plans and it was so frustrating. And when we just put it all down, it was like this heavy burden just being taken off our shoulders. And it did take a great deal of faith. It really, really did. It, it's not just that it's, everything's easy and you, can, you always know where the light is, which way to go. So we did. We, 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 we had been trying to sell our house for five years. When we decided to follow God, within six weeks, we had two people fighting over our house. And the paths just, the doors just opened to Franschuk. And the people we met, the paths just opened to come to Shofar. And after coming to my first service, I was alone. Stefan was still in Pretoria. It was also Testimony Sunday. I wasn't sure what was going on in this church because no one's preaching. Everyone's just talking. <laughs> and <laughs> the next day, I had a missed call on my phone, and it was from the past. And I didn't know if I have, must have phoned him back. But I'd never met a pastor at our other church before. So I wasn't too sure what the protocol was. But yeah, um, God has really blessed us abundantly, and he's taken such good care of us. And just the, the way that our lives have turned, um, turned out so far with God with us, I would never have believed it if someone had told me before. But it does take a great, great deal of faith. And it takes a great deal of praying for and with your spouse. So much so that we, um, we got two... Two boys rich in our, in our family, so uh, we're a family of seven now. Um, but uh, I just want to conclude um, and do that in Afrikaans because that's the uh, Emily language. Because um, there's no place for Afrikaans on earth. <laughs> <laughs> that's what my pastor said when we got married. I, I still don't uh, for, forgive him for that. Um, Everything in my life, how I got to God, um, can, be, can be concluded into one, one verse, and that's Acts 26, verse 14, where um, Jesus intervened in um, Paul's life. Um, back, back then, was still called Saul, and he said, Saul, Saul, waarom vervolg jy my? Jy maak jou net seer dier jou te verset. And that's what I did. That's what we did. And that's probably what you did. If you put your name in there, 
Stefan, Stefan, waarom vervolg je mij? If you're not in his will, you're against him. You're either for him or you're against him. So, and then he says, they, you mark net your seer, yourself seer, the area of the first set. And that's what I did. I, I still got scars of the time that I tried to facet myself against his will. And um, maybe I can just uh, ask you, are you facetting yourself against his will? If you are, you're just hurting yourself. Because that's all you're going to get, just hurt in this life. And it's going to be temporary. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan and Venora. Uh, it's a beautiful testimony. Liesel, come deal with us. You mag me Afrikaans praat in die kerk, hoor. <laughs> Good morning, church. Every time Tiens want me to be in front, he said that same words. You mag me Afrikaans praat. Ek dink, dan dink hulle, dan gaat sy gehoor kom. Wat maak jy saak, wat die taal ek moet praat, ek doen het vir heren. You know, sometimes I don't know where to start, but I just want to tell all the parents in the house, you know, I, I really honor you. Those who, who, who made the right choices and those not. Because every one of us are struggling. And for me, my parents, at first they, they didn't have the right choices. And so uh, me as a child, I was hurt. Really, really hurt. You know, this morning I, I come in and I said to Nita, Nita, you need to sit in front because who am I looking to? Because I love my sister. Because from the age of eight years old, my, my mom got very sick and I have a dad who used drugs, so he's not into looking after us properly. And as my mother got sick, I need to look after my sister who was four years old and my brother one year, his, we was just a year old and I was eight years old. And we went to strange people, not our own family. So it was really hard for me because I was like working as a slave for the people and went to school wondering about them at home. It was really, it was hard. Don't have a proper bed to sleep on, sleep on the ground. And I was sleeping on the ground so that they can sleep on me, so that they ca can't sleep on the ground. But you know, all these things, I don't know, but for me, some, some people that are rejected hurt other people. But I don't know what happened in my life, but I just love people. I think I want to, to love people because I wasn't loved. That's why I, I just... That's my mission in life, to love everybody, to show love, because it's, it's not lacquer to, to, for people to not love you, to reject you wherever you come. It's hard. So I, I, I really teach my brother and sister to love people, but they didn't have it all together like me. I didn't go to, to drugs and to, to alcohol and stuff. I hate that stuff because I know that is the stuff that that uh, I feel that my, my father was bad, so it's because of that stuff. My mom worked all the time. And people, that's not good either, to think you work and work and work because you want to give your children everything, but you're not there. So it's hard. But I understand it now that I know the Lord. That time I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why can't your parents just love you. And I, I ask questions like, God, why me? Why me? And I didn't have an answer that time. But today, the same question come to me. God, why using me to go out and preach your gospel? So God is a good God. Whenever or whatever he wants you to do, it's good. But when you are a child, you don't understand these things. That's why in, in, in church today, if you are a parent, love your children. So that they don't look back and wonder why, why all the time. And that's how I grew up with all this mess. And I, I, I want to change everything and I couldn't do it. And in 2009, I, I already was married. And I, I, 
I can, I can tell you a lot of stories about me and my husband. I will really kill that man if it wasn't for the Lord. But he's still with me, guys. So really, I don't know. People say if you, you, you get married and you don't know the Lord, that was maybe not the, the person for you. But I know that was my husband because we still love each other. We still love each other. He's not saved yet. But you know, I'm, I have such peace over it because with me preaching the gospel to him 24-7, I think if he, if he pass over, he just know it, everything. <laughs> then I need to be ready, really. But the one thing the Lord sent me was that husband, and we have two daughters. And my daughters, they tell me, Mommy, we are happy to have you and them. Because they there just love them. They, they don't know, like, shouting and stuff because when I, we did that, we go out of the house because when I, I grew up like that and I never want to see my children, I never want my children to see us doing that. So we went out of the door because I was crazy that time. I was, I was controlling because that's how I grew up. I need to control everybody and, and it was, the Lord really changed my heart. But people, I tell you, don't think, by working and working to change your children's life, it's a good thing because it isn't. Your children need you. Your children don't ask for you to make them that they can be there, but they need you guys. So the Lord comes into my life 2009. It was an uh, evangelist who always preached the gospel for me. It was his funeral. While all my friends was always partying, I was with them. And this guy is coming to the place that we are together every Sunday, every Saturday. And, it, and then when I, when I saw this guy coming, I said, I don't know what's happening to this guy because he was always quiet. And now he's this beautiful, smiling guy. What is happening to him? So I want what he had. So I speak to him and he's sharing the gospel and it was beautiful. But I never responded. And I don't know if something just, if the Lord just laying the seeds through him or what. But at his funeral this day, there was more people that you all can imagine. Because of him being an evangelist, he loved so many people. So there was over a thousand people at his funeral. And that was the, the 21st of, of the 24th of January 2009, at his funeral, people were dancing around his coffin like crazy. And I was weeping. I said, Lord, how can people dance if somebody died? Don't they love him? Don't they love him? What is wrong with the people? So I didn't understand. I was sitting there wondering when is this thing going to stop so that I can ask somebody what is wrong with these people? I never got a chance to do that. Because after everything stopped, the pastor said, if here's somebody today who want to make his life right with Jesus Christ, because it's by knowing Jesus Christ, we can dance like this because our brother is going home to the Lord. And I find myself walking through these thousands of people. And I remember my mom. She said, my truck. She said, what do you do the people you? <laughs> and I said, Mama, I want to do this. But really, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I just know you need to walk to the front. When I come to the front, the pastor pray with me. Till today I never knew what I was praying. I was just weeping and weeping and weeping without stopping. I remember that night, the evening, Nita said to me, the funeral is over now. You can stop weeping. What's wrong with you? But I, I couldn't stop crying. And I know that was God washing away all my pain. Washing away all my sin, washing away all my ugliness, washing away all my hurt because I was crying. And whenever I see people afterwards, after that funeral, you were beautiful. I just want to love you. I just want to love you more. And I didn't know what, what was happening. 
My husband in the other side was, he was afraid of me maybe throwing poison inside of his food or stuff because what is wrong with you? Just say, oh, I love you and you're beautiful and I just want to be with you. And because that was not me. I was shouting if, you, if I want to. Whatever I need to do, I was shouting. And then the Lord radically changed my life that day to, to being what he wants me to be. To be, to, don't look at this father of mine that is a drug addict, but to see him through the eyes of Christ. To love him like Christ loved me while I was still a sinner. And I love my parents today so much, you know. I said to them, thank you for all the wrongdoings. Otherwise, I wouldn't be what I am today. Sometimes we have everything and still we have nothing. I had nothing, but today I know. I had Jesus because he was looking out for me. In my times when I was alone, in my times I need to work hard as in the, that people's house. He was there. Because the first thing when I got saved, I went to that, that woman and I said to her, thank you so much for open, opening up your door for me, for loving me. And I love her still right now today. The Lord is good. He is so good to us. I, I, I just want to share one last thing about my journey with the Lord. I was in the other church and, you know, everyone isn't like going crazy for Jesus. So, Liesl, don't fit in here. I don't know what's wrong with this girl, but see, you want to speak and pray and do stuff and this is not allowed here. You need to be quiet, please. And I can't be quiet. I, I, I want to jump out of myself telling you, you know what? I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know Jesus. You know, the, the first... I, I, can't, I can't leave you there when I'm going. You need to go with me. And the people say, no, this is the pastor's, this is the woman's job. You need to be quiet here. You can't speak. And I said, oh, my word. As I read the word of God, everyone was speaking. I didn't see it's only woman, but okay, I need to, to, to obey. And you know, I said, God, I, this is not working. And I can tell you again, that's why I know God has a plan for my husband. People, I don't know, God can send a message through a sinner. One night he's coming home and he said to me, you know what, I'm not speaking to your God like you do, but I had a chat with him. And he's telling me, you need to go to Shofar Church because you are unhappy in the church that you are. And I'm like, what? I said, Lord, how can you speak to him and not to me? I'm your child. What's wrong with you? But you know what? That I couldn't sleep that night because of that word. And I'm like, the next day, I thought maybe I need to go. And I come and visit Sofa Church. And you know that morning, it was the first time that Ian's come to be a pastor in, in this church. So we, I, for me it was the first, for him it was the first, and I was like, thank you God. If this is the pastor's first day, then I'm not so out of space here. It's, it's a good thing. It's really a good thing. And that same day, Pastor Richard was preaching over worship. And you know what? I was crying in church. Because Pastor Richard said, you can dance. You can move. Because you do it for Jesus. David did it. Did it. And I'm like, what? I'm in the right church. When I come into church and people is like, I said, thank you, God. I just want to shout hallelujah. And people said, no, you don't. You be quiet. You can't do it. But all the people in this church do it. Lord, maybe I need to be in this church. And that was over four years ago, and I'm still in this church. And when I, when I passed the church on Monday, I was walking, and I said, God, Pastor Richard wants me to share. And, and I, that was the thing that I want to share, but... I didn't have a chance because Tani the Leslie and, and um, Johnny is going away. But I, I want to honor you guys for loving me. From the very first moment that I set foot in this church. And I said, God, show me a picture of me coming into this church. So Afrikaans, I can't speak English. And um, John is sitting there and praying for me while I'm speaking. And I want to 
And I said, God, no matter how skewed my English is, if I can change a life with my testimony, I will do it. Whatever you want from me, I will do it. I will go. Because I don't see anyone better as I, as I did in the past. I only see what Jesus wants to do through us. He loves us. We can't change ourselves. But we have a perfect Father in heaven who loves each and every one of us. And no matter what you think you can't do today better than the other person, only by being you, you are the best. Because God loves you. And in this church, I had brothers and sisters, and this is my home. I come to be into a family as an orphan. Where the church feel I can't, I can't shout for joy. These people also speak very softly, and I said, God, I'm, I don't know if I'm at the right place. But one day, Johnny said to me, you don't change for people. You do what God wants to, you to do. And that what, that's what I want to end up with. Don't take church for granted, people. Because there are people in other churches who feel rejected in church. You are in a family. Praise God for that. Amen. <laughs> Liesel, so, um, yeah, it's a great blessing for us. Our final um, testimony this morning is Pastor Tians. You can come up. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> the big man. Just want to say we love you, and it's a massive privilege for, for us to have you here this morning. And uh, the Lord bless you. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, church. Wow, it's so amazing to be here and to see all the familiar faces. Yeah, we miss you guys so much. Charlene and the kids, they send their love as well and they're praying for you. And it's just such a pleasure for me to be able to have listened to the testimonies this morning. Thank you, Rosita, Stefan, Venora, Liesel. Yeah, this is, this is family and it doesn't matter where we go in the world. We, we are related. We are God's children. We are family. And uh, we can never forget each other. Thank you so much for your prayers, for us as well. So this will always be home. I travel a lot. I preach in many different denominations and churches, but there's nothing like coming home. And there's no church like this I, that I've seen yet. You know, so there's something really special that God is doing in Franschuk. And uh, yeah, it's just so awesome to be here. When I told Richard, I've, I've got a bit of a gap. I'm down in Cape Town for a few setup meetings. We're going to be doing a big mission to Cape Town next year, September. Um, so everyone's invited to be part of that. There'll be more info in, in due course. And uh, then Richard said, yeah, I, must, I can come. And uh, it's lacquer. It's so good to be here. Um, so I actually brought one or two photos along. Um, nothing, not very special, but that's next to me is uh, Reverend Sabia. That's going to be preaching here on the 9th of September. So uh, we're not an angry mob. As you can see, we're smiling. Uh, that was on our mission last year in Kampala, Uganda. We, were, we started the mission off with like a street sweep, sort of a prophetic act that the Holy Spirit is coming and going to be touching people's hearts and, and uh, cleaning hearts and so on. And, and we got to preach the gospel on the streets. And we go to lots of different churches and open air outreaches and businesses and government institutions and hospitals and prisons. We go all over. We call it stratified evangelism, touching every strata of society. So our mission at African Enterprise is to evangelize the cities of Africa through word and deed in partnership with the church. If you want to find out more about what we do, we've got a little color brochure. It's in the foyer there. You're welcome to grab one on your way out. But we partner with churches. And so my colleague, He's uh, one of our lead evangelists. He'll be preaching here on the 9th of September, so please come and listen. Um, he's also got just an amazing story of God's grace in his life. Um, yeah, the next, uh, that's, 
those are our team leaders in Africa. So we've, we're operating in 10 countries in Africa and we come together once a year to strategize on Wednesday. I fly up to Nairobi where we'll be meeting together again. We're also co-hosting a big conference for the whole of Africa called Movement Day where all the city gospel movements around the continent, uh, key leaders coming together and just encouraging each other and networking uh, you know, how, how we can advance the gospel in our cities. So we represented in Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda. There's Baba Stephen Lungu as well, for those who recognize him, our international team leader, Stephen Borgu. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where I was last Sunday in Lubumbashi, uh, preaching over there, and uh, Ghana, Malawi, and Ethiopia. So we, we're all over the continent, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do. We've got to get up north where it's mostly Islamic and very hard ground, but our heart is to see the whole of Africa reached with the gospel. Uh, next photo. There's the family. Yeah. <laughs> you guys know Charlene, Christian at the back, uh, Esther and Rainy. And uh, yeah, we, we really, really miss you guys. Um, I was very happy to grow old in Franschuk, who wouldn't be? But uh, you've got to understand that uh, when God calls you, you can't deny it, and there's no running away. I didn't want to be a Jonah and get swallowed by a shark or something like that, although now I'm in shark country. Um, but the next picture, um, I, that's the Turbidor dog. You, <laughs> Franschuk has Turbidor, but it started there where I am now. So I didn't go for the coffee, but I just thought I had to show you a picture of the Turbidor uh, Great Dane, and then the next one. So when you're on mission in Africa, uh, you've got to pray for an international stomach because you eat some interesting... That is food um, in Ethiopia. That they call it injera. That, uh, it's a spongy type of a pancake thing that's very sour, and then they put lots of things in, and you meant you break a piece off and you dip it in, and, and you don't know what you're eating, and they can't explain it either. So you can see our one associate across the table, he's, a, he's from Belgium and he's a bit perplexed and like, are we going to eat this? And the next photo, if you really, if they really like you, they feed you. So, <laughs> yeah. So we've got to pray the missionary prayer, you know, um, Lord, I'll take it in if you keep it down sometimes. <laughs> Where you lead, I will follow. What you feed, I will swallow. So it's been colorful. It's been interesting. I've been blessed to, to travel around Africa and meet our teams and minister in different parts. And, and also been invited to some conferences as, as we've been sponsored um, over in Europe and the U.S. And, and so it's been an eye-opener for me and um, learned a lot working together with all denominations and seeing you know, God's fingerprint wherever you go, um, and, and wherever you go in the world, even though you think this must be the most godless place, God has His children all over the place, and, and they're working hard to advance the kingdom, and they're loving their neighbors, and in some places, it's difficult to evangelize. You can't just go and proclaim the gospel on the streets, and you've got to trust God for strategy and to really infiltrate friendship circles and make friends and invite them to your house and then you can actually answer their questions. But it's getting more and more difficult in the world today and, you know, you're preaching in different contexts and uh, in our church, yeah, I mean, we've got so much freedom to share the gospel, but it's not like that everywhere, not even in South Africa. So, you know, I've even been in the national newspapers and that kind of thing. <laughs> And you must understand, if you've read the papers, uh, you know, it's just a reminder, again, you can't believe everything you read, so they really skew uh, the reports and uh, put a, such a negative spin on things, because they've got an agenda, the secular media, um, but we've got to remain true to the Word. We've got to operate with integrity and lead people to Christ, and so there's no two ways about it. And I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, we've, we've heard amazing stories of God's grace in, in different contexts in people's lives, but uh, there's a thread through all of that. Christ is there at the middle, and uh, the cross demands a response. Each one 
said yes to Jesus and chose to follow Him. And the same is true for me. I wasn't looking for the Lord, but when He rushed in to my life on the 23rd of March, 2003, I couldn't deny Him. I just experienced His awesome power, His holiness, and I knew as well I deserved to die for my sin. But God said, no, I love you and I forgive you. I was alone in my apartment and, and I had a choice to make. No one around. And, and sometimes it's more difficult when there are people around because our natural instinct is to worry about what will people think. And so the Lord spared me of that and, and I, I could surrender my life to Him. And, um, and He could build me up over a period of three days. I was crawling around on the floor, the Lord setting me free from many addictions and things. And just crying and repenting of my sin and offering my life up to Him again and again. And uh, then I started speaking to people about Jesus. And uh, the first people I spoke to thought I was crazy. And they actually put me in a psychiatric hospital for two weeks. And uh, they thought that they would be able to cure me from God. But there's no taking Jesus out of your life if you don't want to let Him go. And uh, so here I am, almost 16 years later, serving the Lord and... I don't know what your story is, but I know that uh, telling your story, what God has done in your life, because He's always been there for you, you are made in His image, and uh, He will never leave you. Telling your story is so powerful. It makes it real for people. In the next month, you guys have, have opportunity and uh, are encouraged to invite people. Um, God has been so good in creating space here. You know, sometimes you've got to go away and, and God can do some amazing things like it started raining, Francia Gragby's top of the log, and the church is growing. So, it was good for me to go away, you know. That's, Jesus also said that at some point, you know, He needs to send His Spirit. So, you know, God's made room in more ways than one. But tell your story. And uh, the reason I'm standing here today it's not just, uh, you know, by, by chance that, that God rushed in that Sunday evening into my life, but my mother was praying for me for four years, um, every week with a bunch of ladies that, that, you know, I haven't met half of them yet, but they were praying for my salvation because I was very reckless and wayward and praying with, you know, compassion, heartfelt prayers, fervent prayers and, and your prayers for your friends and your family are powerful. Don't stop praying. There's a, something of a golden rule. Talk to God about man before talking to man about God. So in the next while, be praying for your friends, your colleagues, your family, and then invite them. God needs to prepare their hearts for that, that uh, divine appointment and tell stories, the power of story. You know, so we as an evangelistic organization, that is very central to what we do. We just tell stories. We tell our stories because what God has done for one, He can do for another. And so I've been so encouraged this morning hearing what, you know, just hearing again what God has done in our friends' lives. And, and I hope you've been encouraged. I'd like to pray for us this morning as we close the service. If you can bow your heads with me, please. Yes, Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that as your, as your children, you say in your word that we shall be your witnesses, Lord, uh, all over the place, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And it's not in our own strength, but it's by your power, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, God. And so, Lord, it's, it's not a place where we have to feel we have to convince anybody but we can just tell the story. We can just witness what you have done in our lives, what you are doing in people's lives around us. We can just share those stories. There's no pressure. Just witnessing, just being who we are, who, who you are in us, Lord, because there's nowhere we can go where you don't go with us because you are in us. You have called us your children, Lord. And so wherever we go, we take you with and, and we can just be. We can just shine your light. And people are going to recognize, even as Rosita shared this morning, 
that we have something that they need. And if they're attracted to that something, it's, it's you, Lord. It's you that, that, that is so beautiful in us. Outside of your grace, we are nothing. Outside of your grace, we are desperately wicked. But Lord, you have come in and you have changed us from the inside out. And you're the only one who can save us. It's only through your blood, Jesus, that our sin can be washed away. And that we can be reconciled to our holy, heavenly Father. It's only by the blood of Jesus. And friends, I just want to share one scripture, one verse with you this morning. And just keep your eyes closed and just consider those words. John 1 verse 12, it says, To all who received Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. And we all have challenges and none of us have a perfect history we all have pain that we walk in this life with but the Lord he's always been there but he doesn't force himself on anyone we have a choice to all who received him to all who believed in his name doesn't matter if the world has turned its back on us. You are never alone. And there's somewhere you can go where you'll be perfectly accepted and perfectly loved. And that is in the arms of your heavenly Father. And He wants to adopt you this morning. He wants you to know that you are His child. If you haven't made that decision yet to follow Him. So I just want to give that opportunity in the light of all the the stories that we've heard this morning, how the Lord meets each of us at our place of need, how He knows our lives and what we need. I want to give you that opportunity if you're here this morning and you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're not in a personal relationship with Him where you know His voice and you know His plans for your life, If you've not received His forgiveness and been set free from that guilt of of your sin, and if you've not been set free from the fear of death, then this morning I appeal to you, make right with God. This morning I appeal to you, receive Jesus Christ. Become His child this morning. And you will never regret it and you'll never look back. I'm not saying that Jesus is here to make your life easier but he's the only one who can save you from your sin life is still tough but God is good and he's got a plan for you and that plan culminates in an eternity with him in heaven that is our ultimate prize to be with him and there's no other way than Jesus He's the only way to the Father. And this morning, the Lord has an appointment with you. Have you said yes to Jesus? If you haven't yet and you would like to this morning, just raise your hand high so that I can pray with you. Thank you for the name. Thank you for the name. Thank you, Jesus. Just going to give another moment. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for each one here. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement this morning, Lord. Thank you that that you're so real to us, Lord. You've revealed yourself to us. Lord, you've woven your story into ours, Lord, and given us a future and a hope. I bless each one here in the name of Jesus. I'd like all of us to stand, please, and I'm going to pray with those that want to receive Christ this morning. You know, this morning the service is really all about you. If, if you're responding to the Lord in whatever capacity, the, the Lord loves you so much.